I'm very pleased and uh, excited to present uh, Dr. Amy Gray-Jones, who will be speaking on fat or other tissues of corpses, sensory engagements with the dead in Mesolithic Europe. Over to you, Amy. Thanks, Howard. Um, I'll just get my screen sharing. Uh, so that should be there, hopefully. Uh, let's see. And yes, OK. And just to say that um, I will be talking about um, uh, human remains. There will be some images of human remains, skeletal archaeological human remains, probably nothing that you haven't seen before. And I will be discussing um, a kind of decomposition of the body, but there won't be pictures of decomposing bodies. Um, OK. So this paper then is a conference paper that I gave a little while ago, actually. Um, and it, the aim is to explore the Mesolithic people's sensory experience of what we might consider the kind of intangible properties of the dead. Um, so sensory approaches to mortuary archaeology acknowledge that the dead have agency and that engagements with the dead were effective, mnemonic and emotion filled activities. And what I want to explore here is the potential for the dead to possess effective properties that might not be as familiar to us in a, in a modern Western uh, context and ontology, but that may also have been a part of Mesolithic sensory engagements with and experiences of the dead. So sensory archaeologies, um, that is approaches that consider kind of the mediums through which humans experience their world um, and archaeologies of emotion and effect are now well established and have been used in mortuary archaeology to explore engagements with the dead and the agency of bodies and bones uh, in different locations and different historical contexts. Um, and these studies acknowledge that to deal with death and the dead body is an effective mnemonic and emotional process. Um, and encounters with death and the dead body were embodied experiences for the living. Um, and recent studies have used archaeological evidence to reconstruct the kind of sights, sounds, smells, taste and touch of death um, and the ritual practices that were carried out in response to it. Uh, so many studies also explore how these engagements contribute to the emotional work surrounding death such as through the negotiation of uh, the management of grief, mourning, anxiety and fear. Um, and as a result, sort of universal ideas or understandings of death and the dead body of grief or mourning have been replaced with really nice contextually and culturally specific reconstructions of past lived experiences. Um, and a number of these studies um, have focused specifically on the European Mesolithic. So I, I try to offer a definition of this in my first slide. We're talking uh, about hunter gatherers living in Europe at, after the end of the last ice age, um, about 11,500 years before present, up to around 6,000 years before present. Um, so, for example, um, thinking about Mesolithic mortuary practice, um, Danny Hoffman has considered the sort of unique sensory experience and emotive ambiguity of a series of head burials in, in Offnet um, in Germany. Um, Nielsen Stutz has considered sensory engagements with the dead body in a number of different ways. Um, so, for example, arguing that the handling of the corpse is a response to the kind of inevitable decay and decomposition of the physical body, and that in the South Scandinavian Mesolithic, there was a deliberate attempt to maintain the integrity of the body uh, by burying it before decomposition took place. Uh, taking a different, slightly different perspective, um, Rick Schulting has discussed the otherworldly nature of um, caves used for funerary practices, uh, and he notes the different kind of, oh sorry, excuse me, he notes, let me go back, there we go, he notes the uh, slightly different uh, different sensory environment that we see uh, within caves. Um, so how changes in the quality of light, uh, temperature, smell and sound might have emphasised their perception as transitional or sort of liminal spaces. Um, and their association with the transition from life and death might also have been accentuated by the fact that 
these cave environments might delay the decomposition of the body um, because of their cooler temperatures and the protection from the elements that caves and rock shelters offer. Um, so I'm not going to go into those previous studies in a huge amount of detail, but to say that they've all provided rich accounts of people's kind of encounters with the dead during the Mesolithic that consider these sensory engagements with both the dead bodies and the burial setting. Um, and I want to kind of add to this work to consider how some particular understandings of the human body might also have added to that experience of engaging with it after death. Um, so I'd like to argue that the corpse and materials from it might have been understood as possessing certain affective properties and that this played an active part in people's sensory experience of an engagement with the dead. Um, and I'd argue that we've actually already been considering these kinds of types of engagement for some materials and particularly objects made from them um, in the Mesolithic more broadly. Uh, so, for example, there is already a growing body of work that argues that objects uh, and the materials that they're made from were understood as possessing certain qualities that go beyond those defined in Western ontologies. So things like the, you know, that go beyond their sort of functional properties uh, and that these qualities can be understood to have a real tangible effect on people and their world. Um, so these illustrations here um, talk to Chant Chantal Canella's work um, and she's argued that red deer antler retained certain affective qualities deriving from the red deer which were then harnessed to make particular objects, in this case barbed points or a part of a spear or an arrow, um, harnessing to make those objects more effective. Um, so the spearing nature of red deer antler, the way the antler use them in life, um, is being harnessed by using that material to make a spear or an arrow and make it more effective. Um, this has been explored for other materials, so things deriving from other mammals, birds and fish as well in European Mesolithic contexts, um, and also for um, plant remains, remains of trees um, by Barry, he might touch on that later. Um, so we could argue um, that it's within the scope of Mesolithic ontologies that human remains were also seen as possessing these affective properties that could be harnessed by making things from them. Um, and we can probably demonstrate this quite readily now for human bone, um, as we have several examples of artefacts, things like tooth pendants and tools uh, made from human bone. Um, I've previously argued that human bone might have been seen in this way, and that making objects from their bones allow people to harness the attributes of specific dead individuals, such as their specific skills or luck, um, by making an object from their remains. Um, and this is just a kind of summary of some of the material that we've got uh, now that is made um, from, uh, from human bone. Um, in this paper, I'd really like to consider the possibility that other bodily substances were also seen as possessing uh, these kind of affective properties um, that could be harnessed by humans and that this plays a role in, in a sensory experience of the dead body. Um, so I just want to move away from thinking about bone um, to thinking about other kind of bodily substances. Um, so I'm just going to introduce some examples to kind of explore that um, in the ethnographic record. Uh, so um, ethnographically then we see uh, that substances and materials deriving from the human body can be seen as possessing kind of supernatural properties or powerful properties that can be harnessed by the living. Um, so, for example, the Aleut are known to have used bodily substances for the purposes of whale hunting magic. Um, uh, so the bodies of dead whale hunters, possibly also uh, powerful shamans within these communities, were actually kept in secret caves. Um, and as part of the preparations for whale hunting, hunters would go into the caves to touch the dead bodies. Um, and this is where the title of my talk comes from. Um, they would go there to apply the fat or other tissues of the corpses to their bodies, to their kayaks, their boats, uh, and to their hunting weapons in an attempt to gain kind of special spiritual power in these acts. Um, 
Oh, sorry, but the skeletal remains aren't on the next slide, they're on the number one after that. Um, so Ian McNiven has also explored the way that the properties of the dead were harnessed by the living um, amongst the Torres Strait Islanders in South Central New Guinea. And here we see the remains of dead humans and dead prey uh, played an active and intimate role in the hunting of turtles and dugong, a dugong are a marine mammal, um, just featured on the recent uh, plants documentary, David Attenborough documentary on TV actually. Um, and I noticed my little red circle has slipped, it should be pointing to the, uh, the thing that you can see hanging beneath the platform that the, the man is standing on there. Um, and here the remains of dead humans and dead prey, so the dead dugong played a, a role in the hunting of these animals um, and this hunting activity you can see in the illustration involves considerable technological skill so they're harpooning the animals from canoes or platforms um, and it's also surrounded by extensive ritual practices uh, and these include a range of incantations taboos shrines and charms that are used to induce the prey to go to the hunters and as part of these practices Hunters would incorporate human remains, often from a dead um, sorcerer or a dead magic man, um, and they would combine those with the dugong bones into hunting charms intended to improve hunting success. Um, they would also consult the remains of recently dead humans to ask for their assistance in hunting. Um, and that involved divination with human skulls. Um, and McNiven suggests that these engagements with the human remains create a dialogue between humans and the spirit realm, between the living and the dead, and between the hunters and their prey. Uh, and, and in both of these brief examples then, um, human remains are understood to possess active or affective properties that the living community can harness through particular forms of activity. Um, and I would argue that this would be part of the sensory experience of engaging with these bodies. Uh, so, for example, when Aleutian whale hunters entered the caves containing the remains of the dead hunters, their sensory experience included an awareness and perception of the fact that they're engaging with uh, materials that possess this kind of power and potency. Um, and I'd also argue that during the European Mesolithic, um, human remains were also understood as possessing certain qualities um, and that, as in these examples, this would form part of people's sensory engagement with the dead. Um, so I think this understanding of human material didn't just inform the decision to make objects from human bone, it also potentially informed aspects of mortuary practice, so the way the body was handled after death um, and practices specifically which facilitate the retrieval and retention of human remains um, for this purpose. So in the Mesolithic we can see um, several examples um, across Europe of the manipulation and retrieval of skeletal material um, at a number of different sites. So I'm not going to go into any of these in detail but just a couple of examples. Um, so over in Skatterholm in Sweden we see um, Liv Nielsen Stutz's work reveals how individual arms and legs bones were retrieved from a skeletonized body. Um, there is selection and removal of elements of the body, so things like crania and long bones from some of the burials in caves in southern Belgium. Um, see really complex and diverse practices in some of the cemetery sites in the Danube Gorges, um, manipulation, removal and redeposition of human remains. So body parts from burials were rearranged, additional skeletal elements were inserted into burials, elements removed and placed in features like hearths or house floors. Um, so it's clear that in some cases, mortuary practices were facilitating and actively involving the removal of skeletal elements, um, either from skeletonized bodies in graves or from bodies that were defleshed and disarticulated. Um, but what I want to argue is it wasn't just human bone that was being retained and that some practices also involved the deliberate collection of soft tissue. Um, so I'll just illustrate this with a quick example from a site um, in southern Belgium. So this is La Bouille uh, des Autours. So this is one of several rock shelter sites in the region which contain early Mesolithic human remains. Um, and in the case of this rock shelter, 
um, the skeletal remains of six adults and six children were recorded um, in this cave. They're in a disarticulated state and dispersed across the floor of the rock shelter um, and across a small pit. And that's what you can see in the illustration at the top. Um, and there was one adult, uh, as an exception, who was actually cremated um, and perhaps immediately scattered um, throughout the cave. So with the exception of the cremated individual, bodies were brought into the cave as complete fleshed corpses and were placed into the pit. Um, the theory is, in terms of the interpretation of the site, that they then began to decompose, causing the body to disarticulate in situ, um, after which parts of the body were then manually dispersed within the rock shelter and commingled together. Uh, and this is based on the fact that there aren't any cut marks observed on the remains uh, and that parts of two bodies still remain partially articulated in this pit that you can see in the illustration. Um, and these uh, possibly were the latest addition to the cave and therefore less fully dispersed. Um, perhaps as part of the process of the moving of remains, uh, specific parts of some bodies also seem to have been taken away from the rock shelter entirely. So things like the crania, the upper arm and the upper leg bones um, are underrepresented um, compared to other long bones. So what's clear from the evidence from the Otura rock shelter is that when disarticulating the body, moving parts within the rock shelter and taking parts of the body away, people were not dealing with just dry skeletonized remains, um, so bones, but they were engaging with decomposing partially fleshed and partially articulated bodies. Um, so for example, those two bodies or partial bodies in the pit retain some semi-articulated sections, um, but other parts of them have been removed and taken and distributed in the rock shelter. If part of the body was still articulated when those bits were removed, then it's likely that people were engaging with decomposed bodies that retained flesh, connective tissue and decomposition products rather than this fully skeletonized body. Um, perhaps some of the loose articulations had decayed, releasing things like the cranium, the arms at the shoulder and the hands and the feet, but the more persistent articulations like the hips, the pelvis and the spine were still intact. So in fact, we could see the pit feature as a container for these initial decomposition products and tissues. Um, so adipocere decomposing fleshy tissues, um, specifically designed to allow access to these substances. And perhaps the decision to place the bodies in the cave environment in itself, um, as Rick Schulting suggested, not necessarily for this site, but might have been intended to promote this controlled and slower decomposition of the remains, allowing this prolonged access to these substances. So I would argue that the treatment of human remains at this rock shelter was intended to facilitate access to certain bodily substances that may have included skeletonized elements, but also other materials. Um, and this was carried out in order to harness the properties that these substances possessed. And kind of looking at the ethnographic record, we su could suggest that these substances had powerful or magical or apoptotraic properties and might have been employed in ritual practices, perhaps to ensure success in hunting or in other activities. Um, and so we can also think about what this means for people's sensory experience or engagement with the dead at the Otoa rock shelter uh, by thinking about how they might have experienced um, this place. Um, so we can talk through the kind of how we might um, experience the site. Um, and you might begin by approaching this shelter, um, which is high up in a cliff. The entrance isn't very small, uh, but the roof vault quickly slopes downwards so that at the back of the chamber where the dead are laid, um, that is some distance away, about 20 metres away and in darkness. So we can think about what we might see and experience um, in this site. As you continue further into the dark, your movement's restricted, you're perhaps temporarily disorientated. It could be dimly lit if someone has attended uh, to lighting the lamps in preparation for your visit, but it's still darker and cooler and quieter than the day outside as you make your way to these bodies. The air might feel damp and cool, 
it might smell earthy, but that's quickly replaced by the strong odour of decomposing flesh as the space become more, uh, becomes more enclosed. That smell could be familiar to you if you've been here before, and the experience might bring back the memories of attending to other deaths and other bodies, uh, making associations with other times and events and persons uh, living or dead. Your eyes might start to adjust the low light. You can see the bones of, of previous people scattered on the surface alongside the cave wall. Um, the decay and the, de and the degree of disarticulation of the body is a marker of the time that has passed. And before you leave, you might you might reach around um, and, and look for a small part, a hand or a foot bone to place in the wall crevice as is customary and perhaps as you've done every time you've been there. Um, you make your way past and through the scattered remains uh, to the remains of the bodies in the pit. And here you reach down to touch uh, the remains. You, they might feel cold and slimy, uh, tissue and other substances. Uh, you might lift some away, hold them in your hand and place them in the container or the wrapping that you've brought with you to retrieve this material. Now, the sensations of this might have been unpleasant. So, you know, inducing gagging or nausea. There might also well be a sense of grief and loss for this member of the community. Um, but in understanding these bodily substances as possessing powerful properties, other senses and emotions might come into play. Um, so the smell of decay might bring with it a sense of engaging with something potent, resulting in feelings of, of wonder or anticipation or excitement uh, or even fear. Similarly, in touching the bodily tissues, there might have been the sense of physically encountering something powerful, something that had to be handled with care. Um, and there might also be the memories of using those substances in other contexts. So perhaps like the Aleut, the substances were collected, went on to be used in hunting rituals where they were used to harness the power of the dead. Alternatively, they might have been employed in other forms of practice where the qualities of that specific deceased individual, such as their skill or their good luck, were applied to the living to ensure a successful outcome. <clears throat> and such memories would have reinforced the potency and the power of the bodily substances as they were removed from the corpse and taken from the cave. So, to kind of sum up then, I would argue that uh, dead bodies and substances deriving from them might have been understood as possessing powerful properties that had an effect on the world and that some forms of mortuary practice involved the collection of these materials for their use in other contexts. And these weren't simply intangible or abstract notions, but the memory of previous applications of these substances and their successful outcomes would render these properties a real and tangible um, aspect of the world that can be experienced. Uh, so as such, we should consider them as part of the way that the living um, engaged with the dead um, during the European Mesolithic 